All right, um, I will just start now. Um, so my name is Yannick and I'm a developer slash DevOps slash security person from Hamburg, Germany. And I'm now doing this talk really spontaneously. So I just uh, filed out the, the, the form yesterday to submit this talk. And so there's not going to be any slide or anything really prepared other than the tabs that you're seeing here in my Firefox tab bar uh, and some kind cluster that I just started a couple of minutes ago. Um, and what I'd want to show you today is an open source project, which is not from the CNCF, but it's from the OWASP Foundation, which is more of a security foundation than a DevOps slash cloud native foundation. Uh, and I'm going to show you two projects which belong together. One is the G-Shop project, which I have open right now. And the other one is the multi user project, which belongs to the G-Shop project. Um, it's basically a side project of it to basically make it runnable and uh, usable from Kubernetes. Um, so what Jushop is, is it's <laughs> what we call it is an intentionally vulnerable web application. So it's basically a web application that is intentionally developed badly. So a web application built in Node.js which just a bunch of security vulnerabilities in it. And the primary use case for it is to learn about security vulnerabilities, especially in the web space, um, so that you can basically just start the juice shop and then start hacking around in like a playground environment um, without <laughs> risking to get sued by, by hacking something which is actually running in production somewhere. So this is basically just a friendly training environment just for people to try out and uh, play with uh, software security. Um, and the second part is this multi user platform, which we're going to take a look later, which is basically um, juice shop, it just running on Kubernetes for multiple users at a time uh, for training settings where you may be hosting a centrally organized training for more than a couple of people. And you don't want everybody to uh, install juice shop on their local machines, but want to provide it for them. Uh, but we, before we're going to jump into the multi user side, I just want to show you a bit of what Jushop is and what it looks like and how you can use it. Um, so what I have open here right now is the Jushop repository, uh, which is just on GitHub Jushop slash Jushop. Um, and Jushop is, like I said earlier, it's an application written in Node.js, so it's entirely JavaScript, both on the front end and the back end. Um, and what you can do to basically make it run on your site is either basically just install it from source. So basically just do a git clone and then just running the NPM installs to get the dependencies. But as we're here on KubeCon, there's also obviously a Docker package or a Docker container for it, which you can just um, start up. It's basically just a Docker container which you can just run and you need to port forward the port 3000. Uh, and then you can use it just locally. Uh, which is also one thing that I've prepared here. So if we go to my terminal, I think it's this tab here. Uh, I just started or I just ran uh, this container here in the latest version. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at how GShop looks like so that you get a better feeling for it. Um, so this is the primary web interface of GShop. So basically GShop as an intentionally vulnerable web application. What it is is basically just a a fake web shop where you can buy all sorts of things. Um, as this is a fake shop, you can obviously can't really buy anything. You can't spend any money. You can basically you don't risk anything, but it just basically looks like a standard boring um, uh, web shop where you can buy things. And the interesting thing is now that basically under underneath all of these features which are packed in this juice shop, there are uh, actually more than a hundred different kinds of vulnerabilities in them. Um, and just to give you a feeling of it, we're just going to run one of the more basic ones. So one thing that this G-Shop has is it has a user sign-in, so already signed in. So if I go to accounts here and go to login, I can basically just log in and I can basically just do a normal login. But what you will find is that this login form is just vulnerable to an SQL injection. So basically, you can, can also try to do an SQL injection here um, to make it do interesting things. The one thing that we can just try is basically instead of providing an actual email here is that we try to circumvent the security measures to provide a SQL string inside of this form. 
so that we can do a login without actually providing it a password. Um, so like the normal one would just be, which is type in demo, demo, which works because it's a demo user account. But now if we would try to do it with an SQL injection, what we can just try is basically just try some, uh, some quotation marks here um, just to see if this does anything interesting. And what we already see is by just basically putting some quotation marks in here, we can see that we're getting this weird error back. <laughs> you don't know this uh, notation. This is basically the standard JavaScript uh, error or, or object stringification. Uh, this is already looking very interesting. And one thing that we can just try, if we just imagine that this is like an SQL string, which is saying something like select a star from users where uh, email is such and such and password hash is such and such and such. Um, we can basically just try to do this with an SQL injection to now say, okay, I want, an, I want to have a user row back where either the email is this thing here or where the expression one equals one uh, is true. Um, so it's basically just always true and it will just return the first row in the database just like a relatively normal SQL injection type of thing. What I'm then just going to do is I'd put a semicolon here to basically say, okay, this statement is now over. Don't even look at the password part. And then just come, come, comment out with the minus minus the rest of the SQL, SQL statements. So basically this is now basically just get, getting me back the first user in the database. Um, and by that, I can basically just log in. And if I do this, I can see, okay, I'm now successfully signed in. And if I now look at look here, I hope this is somewhat readable. Um, in this case, even signed in as an as administrator, because in this case, the administrator was the first user in the database, because it was the first user who actually signed up for the service. Um, so I'm now also by coincidence signed in as the um, user administrator. Um, and as I said earlier, so this is one challenge. We also see that we got this Oh, no, wait, I, sorry, I solved this earlier when preparing, so I really didn't get this nice batch. We only got this for uh, this missing error handling. Um, but the nice thing in GShop is GShop also has a scoreboard and it has a session or a, a, a tracking for all of the different hacking challenges that it has. So basically in the scoreboard, I have the list of all hacking challenges that are in GShop and I can already see basically which challenges I have solved and which challenges are available in GShop in general. And like I said earlier, um, uh, GShop now has over 100 different hacking challenges in all kinds of categories, especially from the web development sphere, but also some which slightly touch into the cloud native sphere. Um, so there's just a lot of things that you can do, uh, a lot of things that you can try out and especially nice as a teaching tool if you're uh, working at a company and you have like a web development team. Uh, this is just a very cool tool to basically do like a, like a day-long workshop with them. Uh, basically just run them through on how web application security works and especially on how hackers would potentially try to uh, attack their applications. Uh, it's just a really cool tool to just walk you through and uh, see how this is working uh, and learn, on, learn yourself on how uh, these vulnerabilities can be used. Um, so maybe just one, one challenge which slightly touches on um, cloud native things is there's a challenge called, uh, I think it's called exposed metrics, uh, which is this one here, um, which might be, um, might ring a bell for people using uh, Prometheus uh, for their metric system. So in this case, Jushop also provides Prometheus metrics uh, the problem here is that Fuchsia basically does, no or does nothing in a way to protect these metrics. So basically everybody who can access the application can just basically go into the URL browser bar uh, and just type in slash metrics here. And what we're then going to get back is just the Prometheus metrics endpoint where there are all kinds of interesting things. Nothing super critical, so this is more of an information disclosure type of thing. Uh, but definitely something that we wouldn't want to expose to every user. Uh, there are just a bunch of these different challenges just to teach people on uh, what kind of things to look out for when developing applications. Uh, so now if we refresh this, for example, this exposed metrics is now marked as green because it's now solved. 
Uh, and one nice thing is also with most of these challenges now, we also have these associated coding challenges. So it's not just like the hacking side of it, but we also have the coding side of it where we can basically just open this up. And what we're going to see here then is basically the actual vulnerable code running inside of G-Sharp. Uh, and then there are basically two types of challenges uh, on the coding side to basically mark the, the vulnerable code. In this case, just basically marking which lines are vulnerable and then in the second step to basically select from a selection of four different choices, basically which one is the correct fix um, that you could apply to make this vulnerability go away. Um, another really nice thing with Jushop is um, Jushop also has um, this uh, companion <laughs> guidebook. So, which is this basically this ebook, which you can also just um, take a look at online. Uh, it's completely free. Um, so, you can pay money for it to give the project a bit more budget, um, which has a guide and an explanation how, how to solve each challenge in Jushop and basically what's wrong with each of the challenges, um, which is a very awesome tool if you're basically just going through Jushop and you might be a bit overwhelmed by the scoreboard and all of the challenges in there. Um, you can basically just then reference this uh, companion guide to just take a look and uh, yeah, really learn on how these challenges can be solved and uh, how you might be able to prevent them in your own applications. Um, this is all cool now, but uh, I now want to do the shift over to, to the second project. This is the one that I primarily want to show because basically Jushop um, is primarily intended as basically a single user application. Um, so it's just just meant to be run on a local machine uh, and used by by one one user or maybe two users sitting at the same keyboard, but it's basically not meant to be shared across multiple people because it has this challenge tracking built into it. Uh, it has like a local SQLite database. It's just basically just not meant to be used by multiple people at a time. Um, and this is a problem if you, for example, want to now run a training with 20 people. Because if you run a training with 20 people and most of them are developers, you're going to spend the first two or three hours of this training basically debugging NPM setups to get Jushop installed on everybody's machine. And then somebody has like a crazy Docker proxy setup, so you can't also switch back to Docker if NPM doesn't work. It's just always a pain because you basically just spend the first hours of these training sessions basically just debugging people's laptops. <laughs> and I, I, even, I hate debugging my laptop enough. I don't need to debug other people's laptops. Um, so what we basically did is we started a side project to Juice Shop, which is this tool called Multijuicer, uh, which is now basically part of the official Juice Shop project. So it's basically a sub project in the larger project. And what this multi-user project is, is a, basically a platform to dynamically start up Jushop pods on a Kubernetes cluster and then expose them um, just to the network via one host name um, by having like a dedicated load balancer, which then basically gives every team their own Jushop instance and ensures that basically uh, the teams can hack on their individual Jushop instances, uh, but that they won't affect each other. There's also a short uh, diagram here. I'm just going to zoom in a bit to make it a bit more readable. Um, so basically, it has or this multi-juicer consists of one primary component, which is this component called a juice balancer, which is basically a custom-built load balancer, like I said earlier, which is getting the traffic from the different teams and is then basically redirecting this traffic to the dedicated Jushop instances for the team. And the nice thing is, is basically because this uh, multi user platform is basically directly built for Kubernetes, it's also able to spin up these Juice Shop instances on demand. So if a new team comes around and you basically don't have a Juice Shop instance for them yet, uh, they can basically just re uh, register. And what multi user will do is we're going to talk to the Kubernetes API to start up a new uh, Juice Shop pod for them and then just going to wait until the pod is ready and then. Be, uh, the team can just start hacking on the new pod. Um, the installation for it is also really easy. So it's basically just multi has just a Helm chart. Um, we recently switched from uh, the Helm repo YAML 
to having the chart only in an OCI registry. So this is still looking kind of crazy, especially like with these GitHub package links. So this is basically just a, a helm chart in this OCI registry. And what I would like to do now is basically just, basically just run this once on uh, my local machine here, and then we can maybe just take a look on how this is working. So first I'm just gonna shut down this Docker container so that I have this port 3000 freed up because I'm gonna need this in a minute. Um, and then, so basically right now, let me just make sure that I cleaned up earlier. Yeah, okay, perfect. So what I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna run the Helm install. I'm really hoping that the images are still cached on this cluster because the network is kind of slow. Um, no offense to the network sponsors, <laughs> but, um, ah, perfect, they are still cached. So everybody, everything is already up and running. That was really quick. Um, so I'm now just gonna port forward my port 3000, not to the juice shop directly, but in this case to the juice balancer. Um, let me see if this is in my history here. Yep. Um, so if I now go back to my browser and open up port 3000, yep. I'm not a juice shop anymore, but I'm now at multi-juicer, which just has this very straightforward UI. Um, which just consists of a form field to ask, uh, which asks me to put in the team name and I can put basically, no, nah, not, not quite everything in there, but just everything with just standard characters. So if I just put in the name KubeCon and click create team, what we're then gonna see if I'm switching back to the cluster view is that in the background, uh, multi-juicer already started up a new pod here or actually started up a new deployment um, with basically just the name team KubeCon juice shop instance. Um, so it already started, the juice shop is also already run it, running. Um, so if I'm switching back to the browser here now, you can see now, okay, <laughs> it also says, tells me that the instance is now ready and I can basically just start clicking on start hacking. Uh, and now I have this uh, juice shop um, running here. Uh, but I didn't need to start it up locally, so I could just put this on my Kubernetes cluster at my company and basically just host all of these juice shop instances for all of the participants of a training so that the participants wouldn't have to do this themselves, um, just as a way to make these trainings more straightforward, make this easier, um, and yeah, just really safe on the, on the starting uh, time of the trainings by just providing it to them uh, centrally. Um, yeah, um, so what we also have in multi-juicer, um, so basically right now we've primarily <laughs> uh, promoted um, this uh, multi-juicer tool inside of the uh, security community. And what we found there is that the security community <laughs> is often really lacking Kubernetes skills. So what we did was we put in some really detailed guides on how you can install them on different clusters because we got, just got really specific requests on how we can help them with like specific cloud providers and cases where they didn't even have a cluster to start with. Um, so basically we have just really detailed guides for security teams with with, with very little uh, Kubernetes experience on how they could set it up. Uh, but as I said earlier, so multi is really just this um, relatively straightforward Helm chart. So if you're, <laughs> if you're trying to use it, I'm very confident that everybody here at KubeCon is able to just install it um, without much problem. So it's very easy to configure, um, uh, very easy to change, change the settings uh, just with normal Helm things. Um, we also have this dedicated production notes guide here, because basically the, the, the default configuration is primarily used for easy testing. Um, but if you actually want to run a, like a production level um, uh, training, you will probably want to have more than one balancer instance, just in case the first one goes down. And you will also want to make sure that like a couple of secrets are rotated because the, um, because the default Helm values actually has a couple of, uh, uh, I would say security problems in it because it has a couple of hard-coded secrets because they are supposed to be rotated before you install it on production. Uh, it's not a huge issue, but uh, it's all detailed here in the, in the guide basically on how you can easily rotate these uh, secrets, um, which is basically just linked directly with, 
uh, below the helm install. So if you are, if you want to run it, I'm sure you will find these production nodes as well. Um, yeah, and basically this project has now been going for, um, or this multi-user project has been going for, I think, like since 2020. Um, and I just learned that basically Dewshop and Kubernetes basically must have started in the same year because Dewshop is also turning 10 this year. It's basically <laughs> this is the same age. Um, um, and the nice thing is that with multi user basically already being also a couple of years old, um, we now also have uh, another project in the in the OWASP Foundation, which is this. Uh, so this is more of a sideline here because I'm basically already finished with the multi user part. But if you're also interested in this, like other security training environments, I can also really recommend this OWASP Wrong Secrets project. Uh, which is more focused on like secret management best practices. Um, and the nice thing is, is uh, this wrong secrets environment also basically has a, a multi-user platform, which is just based on multi-user because they basically just fork the repo and then change some configurations for it. Um, so it's basically also multi-user compatible. So if you want to run a a training more on the secrets management side. This is basically also a WASP tool for it, which you can just use to run these trainings. Um, yeah. Uh, also very cool for yeah, multi-user trainings. Yeah, and this is basically already everything that I really wanted to show you. Um, I think we still have quite a lot of time left, so if anybody has any questions or anything that we would like to take a look at together, um, definitely can do that. Otherwise, thank you all for being here. And so, there's a mic coming to you. So while you were explaining this, I was thinking, you know, I could put that in my integrations environment. I could make that part of my annual training for my for my devs. And then I realized that my Container and vulnerability scanners probably going to find it, or my, <laughs> or my uh, static code analysis scanners are probably going to find it. Uh, I might not want to put it on the integrations environment, but I, I would hope that your scanner is going to find it. Otherwise, you might want to take a look at another scanner. <laughs> yeah. It's it's actually crazy because with the Dewshop project, we've been getting, especially lately, we've been getting this, like a ton of spam pull requests where just people are trying to integrate like different scanning tools in their pipelines. And I'm not quite sure if they are intentionally opening up pull requests because like 90% of the pull requests that we're getting are people just trying out random security tools and I'm hoping accidentally opening up pull requests for them. I'm not sure if they're just blindly following some security uh, training guides uh, when they don't understand what a pull request is, but it's getting quite annoying. But so basically it's, it's a tool which also often used by different security or by, by people trying out different security tools because it's very, very easy or very, just a very good tool to basically just benchmark these tools if they are able to actually find things. But the PRs you're getting are people trying to patch the vulnerabilities or have you update to a less vulnerable version or? Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's really following a pattern. <laughs> it's, I mean, most of them are busy just adding, adding different CI integrations uh, for different tools without a comment, basically really just trying this out. Some people are also just randomly changing text just to see if things are getting triggered, I guess. I, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand it, but it just, it just seems that a lot of people are trying things out there um, with tools. All right, any other questions in the bank? So in a juicer UI, juicer, right? Yeah, you shop. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, one section you were, uh, I saw that there is a way to fix it, you know? So is that the fixing is how happening? I mean, do we commit in a code or something like that? Uh, maybe we can just do one together just to make it more visual. So um, basically the, the find it is just basically just marking the lines. Oh no, this is not gonna be interesting if I can actually fix it. 
Um, so this is for the metrics thing. I mean, just this was probably the point here where this is exposed, where we are basically mounting the shroud. So if I submit this, then we can basically just see this more easily. Um, so basically now we've basically found the place where this is because here in this line, um, the metrics actually exposed. And with the fix, it basically how this is working is that you have a bunch of different options here, or a bunch usually three or four. Um, but this is not basically okay. patched directly into the image. It's, it's basically just if you are able to find it, but but it doesn't change the running software. Okay, thank you. Hey, so this is really interesting stuff. Um, I'm really excited to hear about all of this and a little embarrassed I'm hearing about some of it for the first time. I think it should be a little more well-read, I guess. Um, one thing I noticed that was kind of listed as a selling point is it says it's self-contained where additional dependencies are prepackaged or will be resolved and downloaded automatically. Um, it doesn't seem to be updated all that often, which means that I think there's some supply chain problems with how some of this is done. So do you think there might be interest in putting together an OWASP juice supply uh, repo or something that looks at software supply chain issues? Um, we definitely have like some supply chain -y types of things, um, not, def not really for I mean, we also have a bunch of outdated dependencies in here, uh, which I can just tell you from a maintainer's perspective, it's hard enough to write secure software, but it's really hard to maintain intentionally insecure software, especially if you're depending on outdated packages, which just don't run on new operating systems or uh, new Node.js versions. So basically have a, just a bunch of um, outdated packages in the project already. Um, I, th I think we also have a typo squatting vulnerability basically where we have a uh, where we're pulling in a, a a package which is just slightly misspelled from the original package and the uh, the vulnerability here is basically just to to find or tell us which one it is because there's a way to basically take a look at the package list so there's also like a lot of uh, vulnerabilities basically coming from the supply chain but um, we don't really use this wording here yet because I think these challenges were actually in here because before like this entire supply chain thing naming really took off, but we might want to change this to basically make this clearer for users. Right, any other questions? Uh, well, I joined a bit later, so I might be asking something you already answered, but um, how easy it is to like create a new challenge as part of this? And is there like a community which is like keeping on adding new challenges or, or not? Um, it, <laughs> this is a hard question because it really depends on the challenge that you want to integrate because it can be somewhat easy to extremely hard. Uh, depending on what the vulnerability is. Yeah, well, a follow-up question to this would be, is there like an official guidance on mm -hmm. how you set up like a new challenge for this? Well, basically, any new challenge would have to come in as a new pull request, as a new feature. And we are always happy to hear of new challenge ideas uh, via GitHub or through the chat channels basically listed from the GitHub repository. So if you have a challenge idea, um, the best thing like always would be to open up a new issue just to basically that we can discuss it if it's maybe too similar to an existing challenge. Um, but we would definitely want, would like to hear of new challenge ideas. Okay, cool. I guess lingering on on your previous answer, what do you need as a project to um, continue to develop further? What, do you, what is your call to action? This is an interesting question. So on the juice shop side, I mean, we have a couple of open issues, but these are mainly for actual like development focused things. So just, uh, as we're here on KubeCon, I'm, I'm guessing the, the, the question is somewhat catered to like more of a DevOpsy, cloud native kinds of help that we could need. Um, and these kinds of things would rather be on the multi juicer side. Um, uh, but the thing is that basically most, or basically, juice shop and multi juicer are 
relatively finished projects. Uh, I mean, there's obviously no such thing as a finished project or very few things as a finished project, uh, but we don't have any extremely huge new features planned out. Um, especially on multi user I would though be interested on basically feedback or basically more ideas from the cloud native community on if there are different ways to basically make this um, balancer component that we have here easier and maybe integrate this with basically something more of a pre-built proxy because basically right now this is basically a custom crafted proxy using a node.js library which is actually working surprisingly well. It can even handle WebSocket connections, though not super stably. So I would be interested in if anybody has like an uh, extremely uh, easy way to basically get this set up with more of a standard uh, reverse proxy setup, um, which basically still has all of the qualities that we have with the current uh, thing that we can basically dynamically redirect this traffic based on these uh, teams. Uh, which is kind of hard to do. I, I took a, well, I tried to investigate this for quite a while, but then I basically just uh, yeah, chickened out and basically just went with writing it myself. But if somebody has a really nice idea or uh, knows on how to do this with a pre-built proxy, I would be very interested to, to hear from it. All right, that's a quite extensive answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, uh, any last question I would say? <coughs> does not appear so so uh, thank you all again for coming to this spontaneous talk and thank you all for the awesome questions I wasn't ex expecting this by that many questions but it's really nice to see that so many people are interested so thank you all and have a nice day bye <laughs>